Hello and welcome to this video on Social Action Theory 02, Goffman, Phenomenology, Ethnomethodology and Structuration. We start here with the work of Goffman, who put forward a dramaturgical model. That is, he sought to bring together understandings around drama and dramatic theory to the understanding of society and sociology. And so if you already have an understanding of drama or have ever done any drama, some of this language will sound very familiar. But it is obviously built into sociological theory more generally, and in particular, symbolic interactionism. Goffman said that we construct ourself by manipulating others' views of us. So our understanding of who we are is based on how we present ourselves to other people. And therefore, as I said, he uses this drama framework or language to help explain this further. He said that we are all actors of a sense, acting out scripts, using props, and we perform for our audience. So we are, in a sense, acting out who we think we are, pretending to be something that we think is what we're supposed to be, using props, everything from the way we dress to maybe things that we use in our daily lives, and we are performing for our audience, which is the people around us. Our aim is, therefore, to carry off a convincing performance of the role we have adopted. We seek to present an image, therefore we must control the impression we give. And there are a number of different techniques by which we can do this, everything from the language we use, our tone, our gestures, our facial expressions, and so on and so forth. These are all ways in which we seek to convince other people who we are and the role we are playing. The roles, however, are not tightly scripted, as we might find in a more structuralist theory such as functionalism, but rather are loose and changeable. There is freedom. We get to decide what role we're going to perform in what scenario, and we will behave differently in each scenario. Phenomenology is the study of phenomena. A phenomenon are things in the world as they appear to our senses. So as we experience something, our senses gives us data about that thing that we're experiencing, and that is a phenomenon. We have experienced a phenomenon. What phenomenologists are interested in knowing is, can we ever have true knowledge? Are things out there in the real world their true objective self? Can we ever really understand them? Or is it just a product of our mind and our senses? Do we only know things because we interpret them a certain way? The world only makes sense to us, phenomenologists would argue, because we impose meaning and order on it. Society is a product of our minds. So everything around us, in a sense, is actually meaningless until we come along and impose meaning on it. Until we interpret it, it doesn't mean anything. We have to create the meanings. Alfred Schutz argues that we share concepts and categories with members of society, and these are called either typifications or typifications. So when we share meanings, that's how we interact with each other. They enable us to understand and organise our experiences into a shared world of meanings. They're quite useful. So if we have experienced something and someone else has experienced something, we will create a common language to explain that experience, which allows us to understand each other. And so in that sense, we are in a shared world or a shared environment of meaning and experience. The meanings of any actions depend on the context in which those actions take place. A good example of this could be simply comparing the activity of raising your hand. If you are at a gig or at a rave or at a party and you were raising your hands, that would probably mean that you are enjoying yourself. You're having a dance, you're listening to the music, you're happy. Whereas if we were to transport you to a different context, that is maybe being in the classroom and you raised your hand, the chances are you're raising your hand because you want to answer a question or you want to ask a question or perhaps you want to ask if you can go to the lavatory. It's less likely to be that you're having a party and you're dancing. And so what we see is that activity of raising your hand means different things in different contexts. Schutz says that society is just a creation of our mind. It's simply shared meanings that allows us to cooperate and achieve goals. So having this shared world of meaning is very useful because it means that we can interpret each other's behaviours and we can work together to achieve shared goals. Berger and Luckman argue that although life is socially constructed, that is, we create it as a society, as human beings, once constructed, it has a life of its own and becomes an external phenomenon that has an effect on us. So whilst, yes, we create the world around us, we shape it and mould it by attaching labels and meanings to all of our experiences around us, 
eventually what can happen is it almost becomes a construct in of itself, something external to us that starts to impact and influence us and others in society, even if they themselves were not part and parcel of the original labelling process. So, a good example could be religion. Most religions, generally speaking, begin with a person claiming to have some sort of religious revelation. They come up with an idea, they believe God has spoken to them, or a force or a spirit has interacted with them, and then they create a religion around it. So they worship that God, or they have practices and rituals. If people start to follow that individual and like the rituals and like the practices and believe in the God or gods, what starts to happen is an institution or organisation will form with structures and rules within it. What can then happen is the original people who created that religion, that institution, may die, may disappear as time ticks on, and yet that institution may go on to become very powerful and influence the lives of other people. So what started in one person's mind has become external to them and is now imp impacting on wider society. Ethnomethodology and ethnomethodologists stem from phenomenology and phenomenologists. So they share a lot in common, but they are more interested in how society is created and how meanings are created. This is more of a method than a theory, so it's looking at the method by which these things are created. Harold Garfinkel defined ethnomethodology as a method of studying how social order is created. So in that sense, it's interested in the same thing that Parsons was within the functionalist theory. This approach is interested in how we produce meanings in the first place. Firstly, he said that society is a social construct, that social order is an illusion created in one's own mind using our common sense procedures and culturally embedded assumptions. So there is no natural social order. We create it. It's a product of our shared common sense and our shared culture and the assumptions within it. Atkinson's study of sudden deaths being classed as suicide is famous in so much as that he said that suicide was just a social construct, that it was a meaning that we attached to certain things. So when a coroner walks into a room and there is a dead body, and let's say it's a lifeless body which is hanging from, say, the roof, and there is a suicide note, and there is a chair that's been kicked over, one would look at all the information there, or the coroner would look at all the information there, and would say, oh, this is a suicide based on the information available to me. So if, however, that coroner was to have gone into that room and found that there was a person lying on the floor who had been stabbed and there was a knife and there were signs of a struggle and perhaps there were bruises to the person's face indicating that maybe they'd been in a fight, a person or a coroner might think, actually, this information is telling me something very different. It could, in fact, be a murder. Garfinkel sought to expose the taken-for-granted assumptions we have in an experimental way. So, again, he was interested in this idea in the same way that the coroner would walk into the room and interpret the meanings around them to come to a definition. He was interested in how we do this in everyday life, how we take in information around us and we use our common sense and our cultural assumptions to interpret it and label things around us. So his very famous study asked students to behave like a visitor or a lodger in their own homes and to see their family's reaction. So effectively, he was in a university, he was an academic. He told his students to go home and to pretend to be a stranger to see how their families would behave. The families obviously reacted in an unusual way. They were concerned, they were bewildered, they were angry, they were confused. And Garfinkel believed that this revealed the assumptions they had and how fragile social order was because if your loved one comes home and starts behaving strangely, it may lead you to think, well, hold on a minute, what's going on? And you might start to behave strangely. So for Garfinkel, this shows how social order is very fragile, that all it takes is a, a tiny change and everyone starts to behave differently. Therefore, for Garfinkel, social order is an illusion. It's fake. It's illusory. However, Ian Crabe argues that the findings are pretty trivial and commonsensical and aren't that useful, because in reality, of course, people are going to behave strange if someone you've known very well starts behaving like a visitor or a lodger or a paid guest in their home, when usually they come home and they behave like a normal person as part of the family. So perhaps it's not really showing us that much. It's just showing us that if you behave strangely, other people behave strangely too. In terms of strengths and weaknesses of both ethnomethodology and phenomenology, well, they show how meanings can be created and negotiated, so that we construct them and that they change based on how we interact with them. It also shows how social construction of meaning can have consequences on individuals, so depending on how things are 
constructed, we will interpret situations differently and we will behave differently. However, it ignores the structures of society. So, of course, by being a social action theory, it's ignoring the structure of society and the impact that it has on us. It doesn't really explain people's motivations for doing the things they do. It underestimates the unequal distribution of power. So who has the power to define things versus who has the power to be defined? And Marxists in particular would argue that the bourgeoisie, the riches in society, have the power to define things as whatever they wish. So they may define certain behaviours as illegal, for example, in order perhaps to criminalise the proletariat who have very little power to define things around them. Postmodernists would argue, actually, all of this is just another meta-narrative. This is just a bunch of academics coming up with some ideas. Doesn't mean they're true. No reason we should buy into them. It's entirely up to us as individuals because we live in the democracy of truth. The final theory we need to consider is the work of Anthony Giddens, known as structuration theory. I personally would argue there are very many similarities here with the original work of Max Weber, but let's see what you think. He attempted to make a unified theory of structure and action. He wanted to have the best of both worlds. And so if we even look at the word structuration, you basically have the two words structure and action portmanteaued together. He argues there is a duality of structure. That is, that structure and individual agency are two sides of the same coin. So we need to understand both if we're going to understand society. Our actions produce reproduce and change structures over time and space. So we as, if, as individuals have the power to shape structures. But structures are what make our actions possible. They are, if you will, the rules of the game. They are the parameters. They are the pitch upon which we play life, as it were. This relationship between the two is known as structuration. Reproducing structures through agency. Well, structures have two elements. They have rules, such as norms, customs and laws, and resources, economic resources and power. These can be reproduced or changed by action. However, they tend to be reproduced. Humans tend to fall in line and adhere to structure. That is, humans tend to do as they're told. So once we've learned the rules, the norms, the customs and laws, we kind of do as we're told. And when we work out how resources are uh, allocated, we often simply work within our means rather than seeing, uh, seeking necessarily to change that. We often reproduce structure also because humans desire a feeling of order, stability and predictability. So often we don't rock the boat. We do as we're told or we try to maintain the status quo because structure is kind of desirable. It means that you know where you are, you know where you fit in the grand scheme of things, you know what your role is within society. And that can be rather comforting in a world that often seems somewhat meaningless and random. Changing structures through agency. Change happens because we reflect on our actions and deliberately choose new actions. So we may, for example, decide purposely to break tradition, although we may know what tradition is. We've always done it this way. But we think to ourselves, well, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. Maybe I don't like it. And so we deliberately do something else. And that's going to change the structure of society. Our actions can have unintended consequences, producing changes that were not part of our goal. So sometimes we do things without even realising um, that they're going to change society or change the structures around us. We're simply doing what we think is best at the time. In terms of general overarching evaluation or evaluative points of social action theories, structuralists question the emphasis placed on the way norms, behaviour, etc. is created within interactions. Structuralists would absolutely argue that instead it's the structure of society that provides us these things and we are simply puppets on the string of society dancing to its tunes that we don't really have the power to shape society around us. And the idea that interaction creates meaning is a nonsense. Instead, we're given the meanings. Furthermore, where do meanings come from? The example of labelling illustrates the problem of interactionists that they have in explaining the origin of meanings. So where do these labels come from? We don't know. Why do we have them? And yet we seem to find that very similar labels exist in all different societies across the world. Labels are, in fact, often so similar that it's highly unlikely that they are simply created in the process of an interaction. The similarity of labels suggests that they are created in a systematic fashion, again, from a social structure. So the idea that we, as individuals, randomly create new labels all the time is probably not true. We probably learn them through socialisation into the social structure. If individuals have such an influence, why do people act in such similar ways? The reality is for all humans everywhere, and of course there are absolutely cultural differences between different societies, generally speaking, there is an awful lot of similarity in how we behave, no matter where you're born in the world. 
Similarly, interaction fa fails to account for why people act in such a consistent fashion. In any given social situation or role, people tend to act in a fairly similar way from a wide range of possible behaviours. So if potentially we could do anything, why do we more or less behave in the same way? The only explanation for this is that roles are located within the social structure and most individuals accept and adhere to these. That is, we quite like knowing where we are and what we're doing. We quite like knowing our position in the grand scheme of things. Social behaviour is not randomly created, but it's influenced by the social and historical context in which it takes place. Some interactionist research seems to ignore this important influence or behaviour. So again, we're not necessarily random. Yes, we may have some free will, but for the most part, most humans behave in a consistent and indeed predictable fashion. So again, we're going back to the very basis of that structuralist versus social action argument. That's it. Thank you very much.